You're watching In Your Interest and I'm Shweta Kothari. The top story that we're tracking at this hour. A 26-year-old Anna Sebastian Perayal tragically died in Pune in what appears to be a death due to toxic work environment. Anna was an employee of ENY, Ernst & Young, and her death has sparked discussions about workplace stress and its toll on young professionals. Now, Anna is said to have succumbed to extreme work-related exhaustion with her mother claiming that her grueling work hours contributed to her deteriorating health. What adds to the sorrow and controversy is the allegation that none of EY's representatives or her colleagues attended her funeral. Now, Anna Sebastian had joined EY as a chartered accountant in the March of this year, which is March of 2024. She was a diligent student, a class topper, a hardworking employee. What was the cost of that hard work? Just four months later, in July this year, she succumbed to work pressure. Anna's mother, Anita Augustine, has written a letter since then to E-Vice Chairman Rajiv Mimani, which has now gone viral on social media. The mother claims that there was an excessive workload. Anna worked late into the night, on weekends, returned to her paying guest accommodation, completely exhausted on most days. She was burdened with back-breaking work she would receive additional tasks above and beyond her job description. These tasks were assigned to her verbally. There was no time limit for her to catch a breath. The case also brings to fore once again the critical issue of a toxic workplace and a culture that drives people to the brink of health crisis and it's not new to Indians. Statistics around workplace stress in India throws up alarming facts. Around 62% of Indian employees experience burnout triple the global average of 20% due to work-related stress and poor work-life balance. The health impact is particularly concerning for employees in fast-paced, high-pressure environments. A LinkedIn survey from 2022 found that 55% of Indian professionals felt overworked with many citing long hours, lack of work-life balance and insufficient mental health support as key issues. Workplace deaths or health breakdowns tied to stress are not isolated incidents. In India, as the gig economy and corporate culture rapidly evolves, young professionals often find themselves overburdened by unrealistic expectations, tight deadlines and a culture that sometimes glorifies overwork. In wake of Anna's death, EY's global human rights statement has also come under scrutiny. The statement pledges to uphold human rights in all aspects of its business. However, Critics argue that such policies are often inadequate, especially in regions where work culture tends to prioritize output over employees' well-being. Now, Anna's case raises critical questions about how global corporations like EY are translating these policies into real workplace protections. EY is facing a storm of criticism following this incident with calls for improved mental health programs, mandatory working hour caps, and accountability for senior management. But the tragic death is not specific to one company. It is a harsh reminder of an urgent need to address workplace exhaustion and promote a healthier, more balanced work culture. To talk about Anna's story and what can the big companies, big tech, especially do to address these issues. Joining us is Prabir Jha, he's an HR strategist, founder and CEO of Prabir Jha People Advisory. Also with us is Srinath Sridharan, policy researcher and corporate advisor. I want to come to you first, Srinath. Now, ENY is known to be one of the top 100 companies as per fortune to work in or work for. However, Anna's case here, as highlighted by her mother without any statement from EY till now, states otherwise, Srinath, what is the use of such, uh, you know, such measures or rather such uh, statements which come from various agencies which rate workplaces if one were to not implement those policies on ground? I think, Shweta, one, we have to acknowledge the personal anguish uh, this family must be going through. Uh, having said that, I think if we have to normalize uh, such anecdotes or statistics that come to the fore, the reality is today, uh, if you want to chase a corporate career, uh, I think you'll have to be ready for what we call the rat race. Uh, so whether it is time pressures, whether it is ability to travel at uh, whims and fancies of the clients, if you're in consulting business, are the norm. The reality is that. 
but if i were to balance uh, understanding the gen z specifically uh, i think you will also hear the other narrative that where a lot of them quit saying that hey i have mental health is well this issue and i want to fix it i want to work only on hybrid and that's something that we have seen specifically after covid that even the it majors are struggling to get those youngsters back to formal workplace or they don't want to designate workplace phrase where we work from so here i want to just bring back a, a recent relevant context of what australia has done right the right to disconnect uh, i think the law about right to disconnect is to say that hey beyond my designated work hours i don't have to pick up a call or uh, respond to an email or in the text i mean why why is it important for the simple fact that most of us working in the corporate sector have that urgency peer pressure social pressure and professional pressure to say what if i don't respond and that's a reality that all of us live with uh i mean i'm not um, saying that ui did not respond and they should have yes they should have um, the fact that uh, one of their employees passed away uh, whatever be the reason it's only basic cultural uh, tenet that in india we will go to somebody's funeral uh, that's a reality that they should have a lot of these protocols or norms that you have i think there is a two way i will look at this lens one the large uh, mnc majors who operate in multiple countries they and try and do best practices i don't think for most of the indian entities including the large ones uh, and uh, i think do, might have a norm but do you know anybody who has a voicemail uh, on their mobile in this country shweta i don't know anybody i probably would know many thousands of people not Absolutely. one of them have a voicemail where they say i can mm. i'm going home now i'm going to put my phone on voicemail and i will respond tomorrow we don't have that luxury we are a developing nation Mm. so this the reality is as a developing nation uh, if you have to cope up and if you want a career if you want to grow um who do you compete because it's a supply and demand uh, we churn out uh, nearly a million engineering graduates every year probably 2 million mba graduates every year and there are not sufficient jobs or sufficient qualitative jobs absolutely so everybody it's a rat race and i think we've called on it ourselves and there is no right or wrong answers we'll have to evolve Absolutely, and and Prabhi, let me uh, quickly ask you: Have we have we evolved at all? You know, come to think of it, Anna's case is is just one of those cases where a mother who's anguished by the death of her daughter has penned a letter in as many words, uh, calling out a workplace which is toxic, which doesn't allow for a work-life balance. But it's also a reality for Indians. I quoted many surveys here, especially the LinkedIn survey of 2022, that points out about 60 percent of Indians are experiencing burnout. Have things changed? changed at all now this is not new we also know of latest examples of where workers at a samsung factory are protesting where sebi's employees are, are talking about toxic workplace so is it a problem specific to young people unable to bear stress or is it a cultural problem that india needs to solve shweta uh, i read that uh, letter also which has gone viral and first uh, i have a deep sense of anguish for the family and thank you for raising this issue on your show uh you know i'll be very brutal and candid you know while you know one can argue statistically the your death year counts for nothing when there are millions of people employed and so on and so forth i mean apart from the heartlessness of it i think it brushes under the carpet a very very strong and growing menace i think uh, this issue of absolute indifference is a cultural disease starting from the top leadership of every company uh, that practices it irrespective of what they have articulated or or what they broadcast to the world i have never been an admirer of this so called great place to work kind of a racket there is none which is not a great place to work most of them are afflicted with uh stress with psychological lack of safety and most importantly it is very poor role uh, modeling i think the reason companies behave like this i personally believe the ownership is of the top management first they set the they set the kind of uh, 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 the norm of expectation and i know for sure whether it's consulting or advisory firms law firms which i know very very personally and immediately i think it is very poor quality of leadership if the entire thing is only about making money in a country where you know you are just you know uh, an employee number and out you go someone else will come in we will continue to be plagued with this menace and it will only get worse and we will continue to talk about how we are great places to work when we are actually not and i think it is lack of absolute uh, sense of accountability absolute uh, 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 apathy 
and uh, and a third rate, uh, you know, uh, uh, endorsement of culture, which makes people believe they are just a piece of uh, machine. And uh, and I do not know. Sometimes you wonder how many more annas do you need before someone is going to wake up and say this is not morally right. Yes, we must make money. Either you have absolutely no sense of of manpower planning, you are understaffed, or some people get flogged because you virtually run a sea of mediocrity in your setup, or there is an absolute uh, uh, insensitive uh, leadership behavior, right? Uh, this entire thing of saying this is the way we've always done, even I was treated like this 10 years ago, 20 years ago, is unacceptable. Absolutely, Praveer. And, and, and it's extremely, extremely heartbreaking, you know, extremely heartbreaking when we when 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 we hear of the plight of that mother, when we hear of what the daughter had to go through, when she was told by her manager that you've got to change the image and you've got to stay on and you've got to take the pressure and not crumble. While well, she did not crumble, uh, she succumbed to it. And that is what we saw here happening. Prabir, we don't have a statement from, uh, you know, Ernst and Young just as yet. So we'll wait for that. But I want to understand, we all know that this is a problematic situation, which is, which has become a commonplace scenario today in many, many workplaces across the country. We know that there is a problem. What is the solution? Because there are HR policies in place. They're never really implemented. Most HR policies are a fig leaf. Let me tell you. You can have a policy, but if you do not have an intent to administer it and execute it and, and cite business exigencies, you will never come, come out of, of this. If the entire uh, you know, purpose of an organization is to make money for them, particularly the senior leaders, you will continue to be grinding such young talent, uh, you know, and, uh, and, and it's just going to get worse. You know, the way out first is kill hypocrisy in organizations. You know, we have had enough of senior leadership speak. We have had enough of, of conferences talking about, you know, a great leadership practice and role model. How are we actually exhibiting that in our day-to-day -day life? You know, and the assistant manager uh, in this particular case may be transferring the same stress and pressure that he's getting from his manager and so on and so forth. So I think it is about killing hypocrisy. It is about truly building sensitivity. I'm not saying we should not be generating business. I, for one, when I look at my career, I've always, when I moved a very large company to a five-day week, I was asked, oh, but you're going to kill productivity. We delivered better productivity, but you moved it to a five-day week from a six-day week. It's the mindset. You know, and the belief in India that hard work, long hours of work, work in office, I mean, these are actually outdated. I don't buy into it. We are creating a culture where, uh, you know, uh, we are celebrating the wrong behaviors. And honestly, India Inc. is short of more wholesome role uh, 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 modeling leadership. How many partners, how many people are rewarded beyond their billing rates? How many of them are uh, rewarded beyond, you know, just the so-called financial number? Till that does not change, you will never have change in behavior or change in culture. And, you know, this is really where leadership will be kind of uh, put to task. I mean, the hypocrisy of it, actually, the more I see it from the sidelines, it disappoints me. They may be successful people. The media may talk a lot about them. They may deliver quarter and quarter growth. But at what cost? Are human lives not an important index? of what leadership is about until that sensitivity is role model coaching you know you don't coach your leaders you know when they are uh, you know they become partners and they've kind of got there only by virtue of long hours and, right. and milking you know it's it's all it's absolutely all Absolutely, Prabir. I mean, I mean, we can go on about this, but it's a very sensitive, critical issue here. And, and Srinath, I think uh, before uh, I let you go, it's also a conversation that one needs to have. Are we promoting a culture of overwork? We often talk about the likes of Narayan Murthy and we talk about 70-hour work week and what it takes to excel. Well, what it takes to excel sometimes is, is also a cost to a human life. It, there is an image problem I see here, especially with respect to Indians, where we want to prove a point, where we want to be the best out there and whichever global consultancy firms that actually goes and hires Indians they hope that Indians will do more give better output I, do you think it's time now that we, sh we shrug off that image of people who are overworked and underpaid see well, uh, theoretically yes the answer is theoretically yes but I think it's a mindset and cultural shift that we need to do uh, I mean just as a divergence to what Prabir said it's not only the corporate India look at the uh, way startups happen I mean 
I think the lens of age has no bearing on this. I know young young leaders at the age of 30 who drive their people through this kind of frenzy, as well as very, very senior leaders in the late 50s and early 60s who work long hours and expect their teams to work long hours, irrespective of day or night, doesn't matter. So I think it's also about the individual trait. And that is what also surprises me because one of the leading traits of Generation Gen Z is this, that they don't take these, uh, I mean, what they would call this is, this is, don't give me any shit or this is BS and they're going to walk away. And that is why we are also seeing a lot of uh, unforced attrition where they're saying, I don't want to tolerate this nonsense and move away. And I think this is, there is a message riding on the wall. I think the Indian leaders, especially considering that the bulk of large uh, GDP growth comes from Indian family businesses. If you look at Shweta, uh, the top 500 uh, Nifty companies, uh, 360 plus, are actually family owned. And most of their cultures, they work long hours. Uh, they expect people to work long hours. Loyalty is rewarded. So it is largely cultural. Unless we change that, I think none of these, all these will remain very, very theoretical. And unfortunately, we'll boil down Absolutely, to, Shina. if you can't take it, Retire. Absolutely. Absolutely. I think we're, it's a cultural change. I think it will take a lot of conversations and I hopefully not a lot of lives to be lost uh, for this cultural change to really kick off from uh, uh, this generation onward, as you rightly pointed out. Gen Z's perhaps are going to change it. They're better at saying no than we were in our generation. Srinath Sridhar and Prabir Jha, thank you very much, gentlemen. Thank you for joining us on this very sensitive story. We're tracking all those details here on Newsline Live.